Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai, ko Erika Austin toku ingoa. We'll be opening this session today with a karakia as we transition the energy um, into the spiritual space of our formal session. A karakia is a non-religious blessing and is a practice of the indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand, the Māori people. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia ma kina ki nga te uta, kia ma taratara ki tai, e he akiana, te atakura, e tio, e huka, te hauhu, ti hei, mauri ora. Mauri ora. Ora. Mauri ora. Greetings to you all. My name is Erica Austin, um, and I'm also trying to monitor all of the participants trying to get in, so um, please bear with me. I'm the um, community activator at EHF, um, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and the host for the session and the support um, of, for the panel, and I'll introduce you um, uh, to the panel a bit uh, later. But first, um, EHF, if you don't know already, Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a community of 500 plus innovators, entrepreneurs and investors committed to Aotearoa New Zealand as the base camp for global impact. Our vision is that Aotearoa inspires global leadership and solutions for the future generation. Built on the principles of tangata tiriti and values of Sir Edmund Hillary. And in the session, we will hear from fellows Lani Evans, Alana Irving, Tish Randall, and our wonderful Cheryl Reynolds as our moderator on Philanthropy Now. Let's take this opportunity to learn about Aotearoa New Zealand's funding landscape, how Kiwis are engaging in philanthropy, and potential funding avenues. We've been dreaming up this session for a while now, and I'm so excited for this corridor to happen today. Uh, and some housekeeping before I hand it off. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be listed on the EHF website afterwards. Please stay muted, but feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we go. And Cheryl will read these out for the panel. Some of you may um, leave at various times and that's okay. And you can catch up um, on the recording later. And thank you so much for the panelists for taking the time today. Uh, Cheryl, over to you. Uh, ka pai, um, tēnā koutou katoa, um, ko Sleepmish Mountain te monga, uh, ko River Shannon te awa, uh, ko Ireland te whena tuturu, no London a hau. E mihi ani ki Aotearoa te wahi no honga, muku e nai ene, ko Karioi te monga, ko Whangaroa te awa, ko Whangaroa Raglan te wahi noho, Ko Hamilton City Council Climate Change Partnerships to Mahi, ko Piri Piri to EHF Cohort, ko Shara Reynolds to Koingala, Norera Tenakoto, Tato ta, uh, Katoa. Um, so now my Harry Mai and welcome, welcome everyone. Um, so who am I? Um, uh, ko Y O. Well, I'm of Irish ancestry. Um, according to Ancestry.com, I'm 100% Irish to the surprise to, of my partner, um, who could not believe that anything could actually exist, and I don't actually because, of course, um, uh, the Irish uh, came from somewhere. But I was brought up in an Irish pub in London, um, which was a great crack mainly, um, and um, I've had a, a purposeful career. Um, through my life as a creative entrepreneur. Um, I, I lived in London and in other places around the world, and I've lived in Whangaroa Raglan, which is my Tarangawaiwai now for the past 20 years um, with my beautiful partner. And we've got two fur babies, Poru and Pai, and three egg lane feathered friends, heady, ready, and ready. Um, I've tried to live a purposeful and intentionally generous life. Um, and I've had leadership roles in the philanthropic sector in the past decade, including being the inaugural chief executive of Momentum Waikato Community Foundation, which is now one of the largest community foundations in Aotearoa. And I was also the CEO of the Endangered Species Foundation of New Zealand. And I sit on the boards of the Akina Foundation and uh, the value structures, which you'll hear more about from uh, Latesha Tish. So in terms of acknowledgements, I first want to acknowledge uh, Nati Mahanga, which uh, are the local manafenua of this place uh, in Whaingaroa Raglan. Uh, I also acknowledge and thank each of the panelists today uh, for taking the time and the time to prepare in advance for this live session. I acknowledge all of you, the participants that are lis uh, uh, listening in um, to wanting to participate. Um, and I acknowledge and thank Erica and the beautiful team at EHF, the core team, in organizing this session, which is great timing because it comes on the back of the Philanthropy New Zealand conference last week that was held in Wellington, um, which had a theme of uniquely Aotearoa New Zealand. 
So the purpose of this session is to learn about Aotearoa funding landscape, how Kiwis are engaging in philanthropy and potential funding avenues. It's a packed agenda in the next hour, uh, which has been recorded as Orica said. Our panelists are three incredible wahini toa. Um, in their own right, they are legends, each and every one of them. Um, and they're also uh, Edmund Henry Fellows. We have Lani Evans, Letitia Randall and Alana Irvine. Um, they're each going to introduce themselves and who they are, uh, as well as what they do, uh, just in advance of each of their presentations. In terms of the format, the uh, panelists will each provide a short presentation. We're going to kick it off with Lani, who's going to give us a short run through whirlwind tour of the Aotearoa New Zealand philanthropic landscape. Then we're going to shift over to um, Latesha, who's going to talk about how to set up a philanthropic trust and why. Um, Alana is going to cover infrastructures and innovation in philanthropy. And uh, we're going to go back to Lani and talk about equity and philanthropy. I'm going to have short questions in between each of those, just short. So if there's a burning question that you have, please pop it in the chat. Um, and then after these four presentations, we're going to open this up. And so your voice can be heard as well. So if you want to raise a question, please raise your hand or pop it in the chat again. Either will do. Um, and I will do my best to ensure that all the questions are answered. So um, we're going to kick it off with our first panellist, Lani Evans, who's going to give us a whirlwind tour of Aotearoa New Zealand philanthropic landscape. Over to you, Lani. Thank you. Awesome. Kia ora. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Erica and Cheryl. Uh, kia ora koutou. No airani ni wera o ku tipuna i tipu aki o ke Brisbane. No rera ka mihi ki te maunga Willamman cloud catcher me te awa Brisbane. Engare ke Pukirua Bay Porirua Taku Kainga, ko Nati Tau Iwi, Te Iwi, ko Taku Mahi ki Philanthropy, Mahi Aroha, ko Lani Evans Ahau. He mihi mai oha, tene ki a te Whanganui Atara, he mana whenua o te nei rauku. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, Kia ora everybody, I'm Lani. Uh, I live here in Pukirua Bay in Porirua and uh, I work in the philanthropic space. So my background is as a youth worker and running community organisations, but I started working in philanthropy about eight years ago and have been volunteering in the space for a lot longer. Uh, and my why is really around wanting to make sure that um, we create a society, we create a world where everyone has access to the resources they need to thrive and we don't see people falling through the safety nets that we've created. So filling those gaps, making sure people have access to the resources and the things they need. Um, yeah, I'm really passionate about philanthropy. I think we can provide risk capital for social change and really push in the innovation space. And I'm going to run you as quickly as I can through the Aotearoa uh, philanthropic landscape. This is my view of it. So it's going to be a bit inaccurate. And also data around philanthropy is really hard to find. So take everything as being approximate. I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one moment. Awesome. All right. So New Zealand, we are incredibly generous. New Zealanders are, are currently in 2022, we were the fifth most generous nation in the world, but we're always in the top 10 and we're often bouncing around that two or three position. We love to give and we particularly love to give when there's a crisis. So if there's a, something, an earthquake, a cyclone, anything like that, we are incredibly generous in those moments, but always very generous. So as I said, data around the philanthropic landscape is hard to find, but broadly speaking, uh, giving in New Zealand sits at about $3.8 billion per year. And if you break it down into business, personal and institutional giving, these are about the percentages that they sit at. Um, so half of it is personal giving, giving from individuals, 35% is institutional, so through foundations and trusts, and 15% is approximately through businesses. And that one's really interesting because 10 years ago, it was less than 3%. So that's a real area of growth. Who's receiving? Uh, this, this beautiful chart here is um, actually looking at the income of charities. So it includes contracted income as well. So that's why health and education are so high, but it gives us a good sense of what the sector looks like. There are 28,000 charities in New Zealand. It's one of the highest number of charities per capita in the world. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that there's pretty low barriers to entry. It's not too hard to set up a trust here. Uh, and the second is that we often center um, around individual stories. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, that we sometimes fail to collaborate because we wanna, we wanna lean into our own experiences. And an example of that would be 
when I was working in Dunedin, this is a while ago, there were five organizations in Dunedin, uh, a town of about 120,000 people, and they were all catering to the needs of parents with autistic children. Very important purpose, um, really important that those folks are, are supported, but each of those people had set up their own charitable trust uh, because their personal experience wasn't directly reflected by the other organisations that existed. And that's wonderful in lots of ways, but also a little bit problematic when we think about the funding landscape, because all of those organisations will need back-end support. All of those organisations will need funding and they create a lot of competition for the same resources. We have lots of generosity in New Zealand, but we don't have the same levels of cash. So if you think about um, uh, the putia, the money that's available philanthropically in other parts of the world, uh, it's significantly less in New Zealand than it is in, say, the US. Um, so these are the key players. These aren't all of the key players, but these are the ones I'm going to talk through today. Um, there's lots of different types of organisations that provide grants and money in the New Zealand context. The first of these is the community trusts. So there are 12 community trusts uh, around New Zealand. They were formed in 1988 and they were originally established by government to hold and manage publicly owned entities, most of which were regional trust banks. Most of the trusts sold their shares uh, in banking in the 90s and um, then put that money, invested the proceeds of, of that uh, sales into um, funds they now manage the investments in perpetuity, aim to grow the base assets uh, and then redistribute the, the income uh, through grants. And there's a notable uh, exception there, which is the Toy Foundation, who still own the TSB Bank. The community trusts give about 3% of total giving in, uh, in Aotearoa, uh, but they're really influential. So the way that they think about the world, the way that they engage in the world, who they choose to fund, tends to pull others along. So they're a really important part of the landscape here. The second part is donor advised funds. So these exist all over the world. In New Zealand, we have uh, 17 community foundations. Uh, they manage about $240 million in endowments and distribute about $20 million per year. And this is a really important part of uh, the sector because it's a really, it's a growing part of uh, the philanthropic sector in New Zealand. So it's growing pretty rapidly. And I think as we see a generational wealth transfer uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, they're gonna continue to grow significantly. Uh, as well as the community foundations in terms of donor advised uh, funds. There's also Perpetual Guardian, Gift Trust, uh, the Public Trust, and a number of other smaller organizations as well. Family philanthropy is, is a big part of uh, the scene here as well. Uh, there are some incredibly strategic, thoughtful systems change uh, players in the family philanthropy space. So people like J.R. McKenzie Trust, Todd, Tyndall, uh, and the recently established Claire Foundation. And then there are also some who are a little bit less strategic, uh, more focused on you know, symptomatic um, uh, types of grants, and some are very conservative as well as being very progressive. So it's a broad, broad range of organizations that sit within the family philanthropic space. Uh, the Tyndall Foundation is probably the largest uh, and the most public. Um, but there are many others and there are a lot who operate under the radar, don't have websites, don't talk publicly about their work, but do really important things across the country as well. Corporate philanthropy. Uh, I had the pleasure of working for Te Roto, uh, the one Aotearoa Foundation for quite uh, for seven years. And the corporate philanthropic space is a really interesting one. Again, incredibly diverse in terms of how people engage with philanthropy and how they think about it. So again, you have some who are incredibly strategic uh, and who've given huge amounts of money. And then you have other organizations that are more focused on providing volunteer time for their staff and offer very little in terms of actual cash grants into community. But again, a bit like the community foundations, this is an area with a huge amount of growth. Lots and lots of, um, of corporates and SMEs as well are looking to set up their own foundations or looking to engage in philanthropy uh, through other means. Gambling funds. So there's a few different ones here. Uh, the lottery grants one is probably uh, the largest. So it was launched in 1987 and has returned $5.5 billion uh, to community since then through, uh, through grants and supporting projects. So it's about $370 million per year. Um, and 
that's been operating for 35 years under a particular way of working. And over the last few years, they've been going through a, a revision, doing a review to look at what that might look like in the future, how it could be more effective, how it could be more equitable. And that revision is currently underway. So it's a really interesting space um, with lots of potential. The new focus is high trust, community-centered, equitable outcomes, future-focused. It's a really interesting thing to be aware of. Also in the gaming gambling space, there are 35 gaming trusts. Uh, they distribute about $140 million per year. About 50% of the money that they have goes into sports and that hasn't really shifted to the best of my knowledge for quite some time. Uh, what I would say is that they have a really high rate of success and a lot of them can be really undersubscribed. So it's an area that because they've done a lot of sports funding in the past, uh, people don't often often don't apply to them when they would be eligible for funding grants in that space. So it's something to think about. Crowdfunding. We've got some really wonderful crowdfunding organisations uh, here in Aotearoa. Uh, we have Give a Little, which is one of the key platforms. Uh, they did about $36 million in uh, in um, pledges, in, in uh, donations last year. Uh, Pledge Me, which has a similar uh, way of working, but is actually does both equity campaigns as well as project campaigns and has an exchange of rewards. So it engages reciprocity uh, in their work. Boosted, which is focused specifically on arts. Uh, none of these require a charitable status, which makes them quite different from many of the grant makers. Lots of funders in New Zealand do require a legal status, but the crowdfunding platforms don't. So it, it provides more options for people who might be in the early stages or who might not want to set up as a charitable trust. So this is a whirlwind tour. What I would say is that this list is not, it's inexhaustive. So there are other organisations that operate, the Energy Trust, the Casinos, Central and Local Government, uh, international funders. And if you're a, mem a registered member of an EWI, then many of the EWI also provide grants and scholarships. And I would also say that this is a really dynamic sector at the moment. So the sector in New Zealand is changing and it's changing at a fairly rapid pace. There's um, there's certainly uh, more and more focus on equity and systemic levers for change and funders collaborating with each other to support organisations. There's a growing understand, uh, understanding of our existence and our work as a bicultural nation and how that makes us unique uh, and how we can lean into that, which is a lot of the focus at the Philanthropy New Zealand Conference. And I think what that means for Pakia, like me, is that we need to understand our own history and identity. We need to understand the history and identity of the organisations we work with. We need to understand our obligations in terms of titriti. And we also need to understand what we can do as allies and partners in this space. And I would also say that there's a growing acknowledgement that the systems and processes that philanthropy, institutional philanthropy has put in place can often hinder the sorts of social change that we're actually striving towards. So reporting requirements, the ways that we ask people to apply, the competitive nature of funding. There's a, there's definitely a, a growing acknowledgement of that in the philanthropic sector and people are working on ways that they can help to change that. And I, I think you can get a copy of this afterwards if you want to, but here's a here's just a list of resources that you can connect to. Uh, again, this is a very well wind tour of the philanthropic landscape and I'm only been talking about the institutional philanthropy. So that's me. Back to you, Cheryl. Fantastic, Lani. Thank you so much. That was an absolute whirlwind and, and you covered so much ground. Um, um, show in the um, uh, chat box has also um, talked about money um, as well, being, uh, you know, such as time banks um, and that having having a slow response. Just a quick question from you before we jumped over to Tish. Um, you mentioned the intergenerational wealth transfer that's coming up. Can you give me a sense of what your view is of the opportunity there? Just in 30 seconds, please. Oh. Look, I think the opportunity is that there's lots of people who want to engage their generosity. They want to gift things, particularly in wills and bequests, to think to causes that they care about. But people often don't know how to go about doing that. They don't know how to they don't know how to structure that. They don't know how to talk about that with their families, and they don't know where to donate to it. So I think there's a real opportunity for community organisations to be engaging with people, and sharing their stories, and helping people to work out where they should gift their generosity. Fantastic. Thank you. That's actually a lovely segue into uh, introducing Latesha Randall now, um, who's going to talk about how to set up a philanthropic trust and why do it. And she's going to share her story. So over to you, Tish, please. Kia ora. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, kia ora koutou. Ko mangaraho te manga, ko Northern Wairoa te awa, ko HMS Mataroa te waka, ko Ross Randall toku tipuna, no Dagaville aho, ko Tish toku ingoa. Namahi nui, kia koutou. So, hi, everybody. Um, lovely to be here with you all. I'm Tish. Um, I, as I was saying, I, I grew up up north in Dargaville. Uh, I'm now very happily based in Whangaroa Raglan, uh, where Cheryl is also based, and we feel very lucky to live here. Um, and for the last sort of nine years, I've been known as uh, the yogurt lady. Um, I've been quite fully uh, engaged in running Raglan Food Co., um, which is a plant-based food company that I started from home just out of the kitchen uh, nine years ago, and it, it grew really, really rapidly. We ended up building a factory here in Raglan, um, employing a really beautiful team of humans. There's some of them there, um, a lovely team of, of people. And so we've been on this big growth journey uh, with Raglan Food Co. And then we got to a point um, a couple of years ago where we were ready to take on investment um, and continue to grow and actually expand overseas as well. We've just launched in the US this month, which is very exciting for us. Our first order is shipping next week. Um, after a lot of a lot of mahi to to get it to that point, and so at the at the point of this investor coming on board, um, it meant that I was actually going to end up with some some money after being a sort of bootstrapping entrepreneur for a very long time, um, and so I started to think, okay, well, what am I going to do with um this putia with this money, and I've always wanted to to generate abundance to be able to then give it back into things that I care about. Um, so I started looking at setting up a philanthropic trust um, and so ended up creating the Values Trust, which is a registered um, charitable trust uh, with two very beautiful trusty trustees um, and just all around good humans, Cheryl, who you've already met, <laughs> um, and Craig as well, Craig Stephen, uh, who's based over in Kirikiriroa in Hamilton. Um, and so the intention of the trust uh, was to focus on three passion areas, uh, which are our three C's, we're calling them. So climate, creatures and children's literacy. Um, and these are all areas that I have a deep uh, concern about and, and a deep love for. Um, and wanted to give back in. So we sort of went on a journey. Um, I'm the newbie on this panel, definitely the newbie in the philanthropic space. Um, and I actually signed up to do a course. So I did the Funding Fundamentals uh, course with Philanthropy New Zealand. It was really, really helpful. And it just kind of gave me a bit of a grounding and an understanding of the space. And so out of that, the vision sort of emerged that we would be focused on proactive funding. Um, so not asking people to apply to us for grants, we would actually go out there and find the things ourselves that we wanted to support and sort of shoulder tap them and, and work alongside them. Um, we also decided that we wanted to be quite flexible in our approach. So it's a bit of a range of impact investment, uh, grants, could be the possibility of interest-free loans. We also wanted the flexibility to be able to start up ventures ourselves and kind of bring that entrepreneurial mindset to it. Um, if we couldn't find something in that space already that we that we wanted to back and get behind. And so as part of this process, we spent a year and a half at least um, just having a lot of conversations, having some really good korero with people who knew a lot more certainly than I do or did. Um, in those different spaces and just learning from them because we found that it was really important to try and bring people together and collaborate on these different issues rather than just kind of jump into something and think that we know what we're doing and, and give it a go. Um, so I think that approach has really served us well. And so in the last sort of six months, we've been able to actually get behind some different projects and start doing some, some mahi. Um, so I just have a very short overview of a few things that we're doing to sort of give you an idea of the, the scope of it. Um, so our very first uh, project was an impact investment in Daisy Lab. Uh, they're a precision fermentation startup with three female co-founders based in Auckland, um, a group of very smart people trying to solve a very big problem, which is how do we uh, transition away from animal agriculture and reliance on animal agriculture and into new forms of food generation that are more sustainable for the planet. Um, so we co-led a, a seed round for them and we'll be looking at a Series A round next year. Um, they're doing some very cool things. We're also preparing uh, for a seed round with Land AI, and this is another uh, startup. They've just gone through an accelerator program when we started talking to them. 
And we were very, um, very keen to find ways to help farmers transition their land into alternative forms of land use. I, I don't know if you're aware, but only 2% of our land in Aotearoa, New Zealand is currently used for horticulture. Everything else is animal agriculture based. Um, and there's actually a lot of really profitable and more sustainable opportunities in horticulture. Um, so these guys are building an AI-based technology that helps you identify other things you can do with your land, gives you a report on what you could do, what kind of crops you could grow, et cetera, if you want to do something other than, than animals. Um, so that's been really exciting working with them. Um, on the creature side, so those two are quite climate focused. And, and on the creature side, we've partnered with um, Hoo-Ha helping you help animals. They're a really lovely animal welfare um, charity that's been going for about 20 years. They're the second largest after SPCA and the nationwide. And that's the amazing founder there, Carolyn. She's incredible, <laughs> extremely positive um, because animal welfare is a massive area um, of concern. That there's a lot of aspects to it. I have a rescue dog myself. And through that, I've kind of gotten quite interested in, in how we're treating animals in this country. Um, and then, of course, we have feral cats as well, 2.4 million feral cats that are, you know, running around and eating wildlife and eating eggs and birds and, and causing havoc as well. So, so these guys are tackling that in various ways. And what we've ended up doing with them is try to come up with a model uh, to create revenue for them in a sustainable way so they're not relying on donations. So we're looking at setting them up a um, social enterprise doggy daycare centre. Um, which we could hopefully franchise and create more of these around the country. So we're looking to build the first one between uh, here, Whangaroa, Raglan and, and Hamilton um, in the next sort of six months. We're just looking for the right site at the moment to, to get going on that. So that's very exciting. And then on the children's literacy um, side, we had a lot of different conversations here to find out where the gaps were and how we could help improve literacy outcomes. And the gap seemed to be around ECEs, so that critical age, sort of three to five years old, um, because our ECEs here in Aotearoa don't receive funding at the moment for books. Um, so a lot of them don't have any books at all. So kids aren't getting that exposure and that familiarity with books. So we've partnered with all these incredible organizations and we're working on a concept um, to create a kit set library. We're calling them little libraries. And we're going to be rolling these out into ECEs all around New Zealand um, from early next year. So we have prototypes being built at the moment. And um, those are going into our first four centers as a bit of a pilot project next month. We're going to study the results from that over a month and then refine and then um, get into a wider rollout from, from next year. And we're developing sort of cute little characters as well that the kids can relate to, to, to go with those centers and make it really engaging for the kids. So... That's my sort of speedy overview um, of the Values Trust and looking forward to answering questions later. But I'm just personally really grateful um, to the yogurt <laughs> and to all the all the customers out there who have, you know, enabled the success of the business and then kind of put me in this really fortunate position where I actually have something that I can give back. And I'm looking at the Values Trust as a, a lifetime project. Um, I'm wanting to to spend my life on this and, and all the time and resource that I can spare. Um, and we're all doing it on a voluntary basis. So myself and the other two trustees are, are just volunteering to the trust um, in these various causes. So, yeah, thank you for listening. And I'll stop screen sharing now, Cheryl, so you can take the controls back. That's awesome, Tish. Thank you so much for sharing and giving an, an update. Um, a quick question for you before we move on to Alana. Um, so, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you set up uh, Raglan Food Co, successful global product now, um, congratulations. Um, tell, tell me about what's the difference like between starting up a commercial for good uh, as well, but purposeful uh, or commercial organization and then starting up an, um, a trust that is seed funding and starting and backing initiatives. Can you just give me a, a sense of what that's like for you? Again, in 30 seconds, just to keep it, it brief. Uh, but... Yes, yes. Um, it's actually very similar. I found it very similar in a lot of ways, that same sort of mindset of, you know, collaborating and getting stuff done and figuring out problems to solve and getting into them that's very similar to business the the main difference that I've noticed is just how lovely everyone in the space is so everyone that I've had a meeting with like it's it's incredibly collaborative no one's trying to keep secrets so there's no kind of like oh we're competitors you know we can't share our IP everyone's just been like oh here have a look at our templates and you can have access to this and please let me introduce you to this person so that's just 
been really heartwarming and lovely <laughs> to see that that's how the space is. Thank you, Tish. Thanks so much. Okay, so now another incredible Wahini Toa, um, uh, Alana Irvine, is going to um, give us a, a, a presentation on infrastructures and innovation in philanthropy. Over to you, Alana. Thank you, Cheryl. Kia ora koutou, ko Alana Irvine, tapu ingoa. Nō te whanganui a tāra a hou, te māra nui a kiwa te awa. I say that the Pacific Ocean is my body of water because I was born in California, I lived in Japan, and I've settled here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, so I feel like I've been all around it. And uh, my ancestors come from the Middle East through Ukraine and um, to the United States. Um, and uh, now I found an identity here as Tangata Tiriti in Aotearoa. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some, I, I would say there are infrastructural pieces in the philanthropic landscape that help uh, plug the pipes together in the background to get money where it needs to go and uh, remove barriers from impact. Um, so the first one, which was mentioned briefly in the landscape overview, is the Gift Trust, which is um, a donor advised fund. Um, that is very common structure in the US and other countries, but um, not as common here in New Zealand. Um, the uh, donor advised fund is a structure that enables you to, as a philanthropist, make a donation to a charity, get your tax credit and move the money over to the charity, but then have a relationship then with that donor advised fund over time to decide how you want to distribute those funds. So as Tish has just illustrated, um, setting up a foundation is actually quite a big deal. Um, and sometimes it is absolutely the right thing to do. And sometimes you might not want to do such a big thing yourself. Um, so you can come under the gift trust umbrella and um, it's like kind of like an instant foundation, but also gives you access to some really great things like um, expert philanthropic advice. So it really, the gift trust's um, expertise can really help you make the money that you donate be effective in the community. So if you want to do something, if you're interested in food systems or you're interested in poverty or whatever you're interested in to really understand who is doing the most impactful work and how could you give to them in the most effective way. Um, the gift trust also has really cool international connections and hooks up the pipes internationally. So for example, if you've got money in a U.S. donor advised fund that you want to flow through to a New Zealand project, but it has to go to a U.S. charity, you know, we have the w ways to unblock that in Europe and Asia as well. And so just, um, yeah, getting resources where they need to go. Um, and uh, I will keep going. So the gift collective is kind of like the other side to that coin, whereas the gift trust is you don't need to set up your own foundation, come, come under our umbrella. The gift collective is the flip side of you might not want to set up your own char charity to raise money um, or receive grants. You can come under our umbrella instead. So it is a fund holding service, also called fiscal sponsorship or auspicing. Um, and uh, we have now 60 something projects under our umbrella, 66. Um, so these projects are community initiatives or uh, collaborative groups who don't necessarily want to found their own charity um, and have to, you know, register and hire an accountant and hire a lawyer and, you know, report to the IRD and all that stuff, which can be quite heavy. Um, so instead, they could come under our umbrella, we'll receive grants on their behalf, and then they can use this cool online system to manage their money. And we are able then to strike a really cool balance between we hold the outer bounds of compliance and give the groups um, as much autonomy as possible to do what they want to do with their budget and their co-papa and their communities. So an example of that, um, Toiwi Totoko is um, an education course that trains Toiwi to help counter anti-Maori racism online, but also applicable offline. Um, but this was a, a collaboration between academics and Action Station, which is an advo advocacy group, and just like an example of something that wasn't charitable trust shaped, but needed to exist in the world. So it came under the gift collective's umbrella and has now been funded. And so you can see on their page, um, it's all transparent and you can give them money and they can manage their grants, um, host events. You can see transparently who funds them um, and also what they spend their money on and also what you know updates from them and really keep up with the project in a cool interactive way. Um, so, uh, Share Collective, I think Lonnie's going to touch on this, so I won't spend much time on it, but I just wanted to point out that it's another infrastructural piece, uh, 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 trying to be innovative, Lonnie and I have, uh, and some other people have recently said this up, but enabling people to give um, equity 
shares to charity. So I'm just very interested in what can we do systemically to remove barriers, to get generosity to flow where it wants to, and to understand the um, yeah, structural reasons why it gets stuck in places and unstick it. So this is another um, example of that. Um, and we're quite interested in, for example, could asset donations qualify for a tax credit, which they don't currently do instead of just cash. But yes, um, more on that in a minute. That was my whirlwind tour. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome, Alana. Um, and uh, having the four of us were at the Philanthropy New Zealand conference last week and heard um, Cheryl Spain, the CEO of the Gift Trust, talking about um, uh, the unusual situation with uh, the uh, with the gift trust that um, sixty percent of the funds go to um, the environment compared to the average in New Zealand. Can you talk to that and and why that is? Just if you're able to, that is such an interesting statistic. Yeah, it is. If you look at like a pie graph of the gift trust donations and then a pie graph of the general um, donations in New Zealand, it is you will see that green slice gets much bigger in the gift trust. Um, I think it's because uh, for a few reasons, the people who sign up with the gift trust, I think, are already trying to think very systemically about how they give. They want to be very effective in their giving. And I think if you really think through what are the big systemic issues that are going to be confronting our society, climate is huge. It's right there. Um, and also, I think the specialist and bespoke advice that the gift trust is able to give and to be able to guide people, I guess, to go on that reflective journey and really think about systemic impact more deeply. Um, I also think that uh, probably climate focused philanthropy, well, I don't want to make any generalizations, but the climate focused philanthropists that I know are on the more progressive, innovative end of philanthropy. And I do think that um, the gift trust attracts sort of that side of the philanthropic um, community. So yeah, I think those are some of the reasons why, but I mean, we've all got to get, we've all got to become aware of, um, you know, what should that pie chart look like if we're talking about where the money, philanthropic money needs to go in our world based on the most important problems that we have? I think we should think about, um, yeah, how big those different slices need to be. Great. And and Lani just popped in the chat box that approximately 4% of funding in Aotearoa um, goes to the environment generally. So that 60% is just enormous. That's a, you know, a great achievement. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, and so now we're going to uh, move back to, to Lani, who's going to talk to us about equity in philanthropy, which seems to round off beautifully um, this kororo and this journey that we've been through with this beautiful wahini. And then we'll go to a question and answer session. So over to you, Lani. Oh, kia ora. I'm going to be as fast as I can because uh, you've had plenty from me already. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about equity and philanthropy. And you might be thinking of social equity uh, when you hear that. And that's something I'm deeply passionate about. But actually, what I'm talking about is um, is company equity. Uh, and so there's a couple of mechanisms that are kind of coming to life at the moment, uh, or at the least I've been seeing coming to life uh, that allow people opportunities to donate shares or to donate equity in companies uh, to be philanthropic with those. So um, Alana talked a little bit about Share Collective. Share Collective is an organisation that we've set up uh, just this year. Uh, and essentially what we do is we have a charitable share portfolio. And we ask founders, investors, uh, anyone really, to donate uh, parcels of shares in companies. It can be very early stage companies. We'll then hold those shares for a long period of time uh, and we will distribute funds that come from dividend payments or liquidation events to uh, philanthropically to, to uh, social equity and environmental action projects. And for me, this came about uh, through a number of conversations with Anaki Goodall, but it was really uh, it was really spurred to life by uh, by the start of COVID. So if you think about the start of COVID, I was working in the corporate philanthropy space. Lots of companies did or expected to lose a huge amount of revenue. And so the first thing on the chopping block for lots of people was their sustainability and their strategic philanthropy. And so that got me thinking about how can we safeguard some of the generosity that comes from founders uh, and companies in a different way so that it doesn't come into conflict with business critical decisions. And that's how Share Collective was born. Um, we, we're still very new. Uh, but it's it's um and it's a speculative portfolio, right? We don't know what the returns will be. Um, some companies will do really well and return funds that we'll be able to put out push out into community, and some won't. And that's okay. We're going to have a really diverse portfolio to kind of um uh make sure we're doing the best job we can for community. But I think it's a really nice way of thinking about 
uh, if you don't have cash, but you do have a company and you've got shareholders, you can actually engage your generosity and engage your values at a really early stage. And um, we think it's the first in the world. There's lots of share donation schemes uh, that are focused on listed companies, but we're looking more at those early stage companies when people really want to live into their values, but don't necessarily have the mechanisms yet. So that's one. And the other one, just briefly, is there is a growing movement in New Zealand uh, looking at um, exit to steward ownership. So how can we get companies to be owned by community instead of owned by individual shareholders? And there are some great examples in the world, like Patagonia is a good one. Um, that was a family who owned that business and they decided to donate all of their shares. There's organizations like Sanitarium, which have always been community owned. And then there are other organizations that are in the process of working out how they can buy shares back from investors and then donate them to charity. So that's also something to think about in that business space. How do we get creative about getting more generosity into New Zealand? How do we get creative about bumping up those that number of, um, of dollars per person that goes into really good causes uh, in Aotearoa? So that's enough from me. Wow, what a whirlwind summary, actually. I mean, and and what all of this does over the last, you know, 40 minutes is it's, it's shown me the sheer diversity and scale of philanthropy in, in Aotearoa. Quick question to my three panelists, please, uh, around, you know, opportunities and gaps. Let's just start here in terms of, you know, we've heard the diversity, the array, the extraordinary array of, of approaches to generosity giving, you know, equitable approaches, lifting systemic barriers. Um, can you tell me if you believe there are any other um, opportunities um, or gaps that we haven't yet um, uh, embraced within, within Aotearoa? And also then thinking about right at the start of this quarter or with um, Lani talking about 60,000 um, charities out there, um, you know, all, all seeking, um, uh, sorry, 28,000, not 60,000, 28,000, fact check, 28,000 charities out there um, seeking, um, you know, um, funding. Um, what What's the opportunities and barriers there? So two questions. One is about innovation and, and what, what are the gaps, what's missing uh, in this plethora of extraordinary approaches to uh, generosity and and what's the opportunity around that broad that you know that challenge of 28,000 charities we'd like to pick it up first and um, people participants are, are listening in um, on this live chat you know if you'd like to also raise a question just put up uh, your hand um, uh, or pop it in the, the chat uh, and I'll, I'll see if I can reflect it to you so over to you panelists um, who wants to pick this off? Uh, Alana, do you want to pick this one up first? Sure. Um, I will give a, a very concrete part of my answer and then a very <laughs> abstract part. Um, the concrete part is um, there are tons of tiny charities. Um, some of the things that I'm doing are about creating common infrastructure that we can share. So we don't necessarily each have to set up our own legal entity and have our own accountant and our own lawyer and stuff. So I talked about a couple of those. Um, we're doing a couple of innovations in there just recently for trying to figure out with the fund holding service, how can we do fund holding for a project that also needs to have employees? Because there's a very interesting, you know, there's kind of the fund holder, there's the project leaders, there's the employee, how do we look after them well? How do we meet our legal obligations? So I think we've cracked that now. And I think that will open up a whole new um, level of accessibility because right now there are so many barriers actually that a lot of people face in the community to getting philanthropic funding just because the systems are not really designed for them for whatever reason whether that's I mean maybe they're second language English as a second language speakers and they're coming from a refugee background or they are young people who just don't have a lot of experience with legal forms and all of that whatever the reason that is and the systems are often not designed for them so some of the things that we're working on are, are trying to find how to meet people where they are provide some wraparound support and give them those infrastructures. Um, the abstract part of what I want to say is if we really want to fix some of these problems, I think we need to like, for example, shift the entire like tax bracket system and start to reduce the need. Like charities are trying to fill an unfillable gap and we have to get real about um, the policies that we have as a society that create poverty and inequality. And unless we really do that, 
uh, we're always going to be chipping around the edges and you know philanthropy the dark dark aspects of philanthropy are when it's like the other side of the coin to really extractive capitalism and wealth hoarding which is not the case for all philanthropy but we have to just watch ourselves and make sure that we are working for that systemic change and that we're not afraid of advocacy and we're not afraid of kind of telling it like it is especially as if we're working in philanthropy sometimes we see those on the ground problems very very clearly Great, great answer. Um, uh, Lani, Tish, would you like to add to that? Uh, I should also point out Craig Fisher uh, in, uh, popped into the chat. There's uh, 28,000 registered charities, but Statistics NZ best estimate is a, a wider population of not-for-profit entities in New Zealand of just over 100,000. So that's, I think, where I was getting the 60,000 in my head. Uh, many of these uh, non-charity not-for-profits are also seeking funding. So, you know, huge demand, huge structural challenge um lani anything else to add tish you've got your mute off oh i'm sure lani has a lot more to add than i do but um my my only thought around gaps um and something that i've noticed is is youth giving um something that i've found has come up a lot people are really surprised that i'm doing something like this at my age i think there's kind of this conception around you know you wait until you're old <laughs> and have acquired wealth to then start giving and giving back um and people are sort of like oh you know you're, you're doing this in your 30s that's unusual and but I think there's a lot of um young people who are really interested in giving and ways to give and so maybe reaching them and sort of tapping in into them um so that it's seen as more something that you're doing along the way and you can start quite young um rather than waiting till you're sort of 60 or something and then starting starting what you're up to so that's just my little thought there. Lani, I'm sure you have a lot to add. Oh, yeah, but um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Tish, lots of people wait, they wait to engage their generosity. But there's also, I think we also sometimes think of philanthropy in um, in really reductive ways, which is institutional philanthropy. And actually, almost everyone is a philanthropist. We, you know, we, we give our $10 a week to Action Station or we do voluntary work and all of that stuff matters and all of it counts. So I think we need to always be careful when we're talking about philanthropy to distinguish between institutional philanthropy and the idea of philanthropy. Philanthropy itself is this beautiful concept and it's a very broad kind of a very broad concept as well um, and a one that everybody in Aotearoa engages with in, in some ways. Um, I guess a couple of quick things from me. One is uh, I think there's a gap around reciprocity, around um, thinking about te ao Māori and uh, how we can have more equal relationships between those who are giving cash and those who are giving in other ways. So I think we've got a lot to learn from, um, from te ao Māori in that space. Um, and the other part is if we want to increase generosity in New Zealand, we also might want to look at tax. Um, not necessarily the type of tax that Alana is talking about, although I agree. Um, but also how, you know, if you give cash in New Zealand, if you donate cash, you can get a tax rebate on that. But if you give assets like shares, like property and other things like that, that doesn't happen in the same way. And it does in lots of other parts of the world. And what it does is restrict us again to the types of things that people can give um, or the types of things that people are willing to give. So I think we could do a lot in that space to really encourage generosity. And you see other parts of the world like Australia where the philanthropic sector institutional philanthropy is partnering with government to try and really increase the amount of philanthropy in the world. Again, for me, um, uh, philanthropy is risk capital for social change. It also shouldn't be behaving the same way that government behaves. It shouldn't be taking the safe bets. We need more people taking those uh, uh, those high risk innovation space bets as well. Great point, Lani. And uh, Alana's just uh, popped into the chat that crypto is also considered an asset for there's no uh, tax credit donation opportunity there. Um, OK, great, great opportunities and gaps. Um, and uh, let's bring that on. Um, another question for you is around um, the Philanthropy New Zealand conference last week and, and was was themed around, you know, uniquely Aotearoa um, uh, approach and um there was this over under you know this overriding theme um on trust building trust-based relationships and manner enhancing partnerships which came through can each of you tell me about how you go about this and and um you know what others should do to enable that and what people should avoid doing just in maybe two minutes at the most one to two minutes um and i'll uh, pick up with uh, Lana first and then move to Lani and then Tish. 
I mean, give me the hard question first. I don't know the answer. I think the truth is that there's as many answers as there are people out there. I was at the Philanthropy New Zealand conference. I was inspired in some ways by, I think, a really progressive vision that was being shared, rooted in Tala Māori, uh, rooted in high trust, uh, rooted in, you know, partnership vision. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are... I think it's good that the sector as a whole is pulling in that direction and especially pulling people who may have been dragging their feet a bit to be like, this is now mainstream, get with the program. I think that's really great. Um, Yeah, but I'm still learning a lot myself in that space. I think the way that it shows up in my work is often just how the practicalities of the system is designed. So like the software that I work on is transparent and it puts the power in the hands of, I would say the people closest to the ground in the community to make decisions and then uh, tries to be um, <clears throat> ac- accurate with which bits need to be held then say by the umbrella organization or looked after for compliance reasons so that we can really share in partnership responsibility for the thing as a whole with the right for holding the right things but to default to trust default to transparency default to devolving power and I think we can do that in really practical ways with like how's the application process designed what does the form look like what is the software what does it feel like do you actually talk to a human? What human do you talk to? I, I'm very interested in these very on the ground practical ways that these values can be baked in and show up. Lani? Yeah, um, I totally agree with you, Lana. And, you know, we're all still learning, like philanthropy is still a pretty new profession. Um, but two examples for me, one is participatory philanthropy. So a lot of the time um, decision makers don't look like the communities that they're funding into. I'm really passionate about participatory philanthropy or community led funding where we actually hand over decision making power for where the money goes uh, to people who are affected by the problems. There's lots of really good examples of that, um, but the youth space is probably a leader. Um, handing over power to Rangatahi and asking them to decide what's going to create the outcomes that they're looking for. So that's something I'm really passionate about. There's lots of papers and information on that that um, people can look at. Uh, and the other one, um, which I think is a really good practical example, is the social supermarkets. Hey, let's stop giving people um, a food package that might contain food that they don't know how to cook, that might contain food uh, that isn't culturally appropriate or that their kids hate. Let's stop doing that. And instead, people are switching to a social supermarket model where people can go and they can choose their own food. That, for me, is a really good example of a mana enhancing process. And from switching from both of these things are helpful. Both of these things get food in kids' bellies, but one does it in a way that supports and enables um, people to make their own decisions and enhances their mana and the other not so much. Awesome. Tish, please. Such cool examples. Um, well, for me, everything is relationship based. Um, and so I think the the key to trust is having relationships that that are deep and they're long. So something that came up out of both the funding fundamentals course that I did and then also the Philanthropy New Zealand conference was just how difficult it makes it for the receiving party when they're just getting these kind of scattergun, grants you know the sort of little one-off bits of money and there's no long-term plan there's no long-term partnership it's not that the the agency or the person's coming alongside them and going along the journey they're kind of like giving them a little something and then sending them off on their way um and it seems like there's quite a big push and so I'm new to this whole space but what I can see is that there seems to be a push for changing that and going to more like a long-term partnership and how we're going to achieve things together um, over a longer period of time. So I really like I really like that shift and I really like that um, that way of looking at things. So for us we're we're trying to work in seven year cycles um, with the values trust. So anything that we're supporting now we're looking to be supporting over the next seven years. Um, and so with the the projects that we have on the go now, that's us, you know, we, we don't need to find anything else for the next seven years. We have more than enough to to keep ourselves busy with. Um, and I think that by doing that, yeah, we can just be a lot more effective because um, we're really partnering up. Thank you, Tish. Um, uh, Erica's just popped in that we have six minutes left, so we're going to do some quick fires. Um, we're all involved in um, governance in philanthropy, and Kate Frickberg spoke at the conference about governance that should be joyful experience to be on the board and, and acting in the best interests of, of Aotearoa and our communities. Um, can you talk briefly about um, how we can ensure great governance on our boards? What's your approach um, and uh, what do you think there are of the opportunities? And I'll start with Tish, go to Lani and then uh, finish with Alana. 
<laughs> so I am brand new to boards. Um, as part of the investment process with Raglan Food Co, we set up a board. Um, we'd never had one before that for the first sort of seven years. So, so I've only only been experiencing that for the last two years, and then I've also joined the the Daisy Lab board. Um, as part of that impact investment. So, I feel uh that for me, <laughs> it's just the same thing all over again. That's that's what I've observed. It's it's relationships. It's how much trust do the people around the table have with each other how open can they be how vulnerable and transparent can they be um I've introduced some things to both boards that I'm on which I don't think they've ever had before which is at the start of the the board meeting we play a board game um so I come up with a game for the board to play a board game um and not necessarily a literal board game and that's just a, a trust building exercise. It's just having fun and getting to know each other before we get into the serious um, stuff of the board meeting. Um, so I think, yeah, bringing some some fresh things like this to boards can really change the way that that we all interact with each other. And hopefully we get better results because of more fun and more trust. Thank you, Tish. Lani? Um, I've had the pleasure of sitting on a lot of governance boards and what I'd say the, the most functional, the most effective are ones where everyone comes with uh, with curiosity, high curiosity and low ego. Um, so I think those are the best two things to bring into um, a boardroom. Great. And Alana? Yeah. Oh, I've just seen, I've seen governance go so right and I've seen it go so wrong <laughs> and it can be a really tricky thing. I think I, I see it in a different way because I've just been on both sides. You know, I've been that executive working with the board. I've been on the board trying to support the executive. And it's a real it's a real art form. I'd love to see um, more experienced directors who've really lived into that art form, kind of mentoring younger up-and-coming directors so that we can do this well. Um, I'd love to see... Um, People, again, common infrastructure, not necessarily every little thing has to have its own short separate board because there's only so much to go around. I also wanted to give a, a shout out. Um, this There are there are many uh, training opportunities. Like, for example, uh, Kite Hoi is a Wadinga series um, that some of the members of the board that I'm on are going on and raving about. I would love to do, which is about uh, a deep learning about how um, philanthropy can support Maori aspirations. So I guess I have an aspiration myself to learn more in that space and continue to deepen my practice of governance as, a, as an art form and contribute it where I can. Um, yeah, yes, I think that's um, doing good governance is something we could think about as a, a collectively and support each other. And I'd love to feel that. Well, we're on the last couple of minutes, um, so I'm going to actually merge a couple of questions, um, if, if I can do this well. Um, firstly, um, Anne Frank famously said that no one has ever be become poor from giving. Um, and um, uh, and we're in New Zealand election phase, and the giving that's been going on to uh, political parties has been significant on the right and incredibly low on the left. Um, and then we've got a, a, a movement, uh, Action Stations Aotearoa, that have started a, a project called Triple the Vote, um, which uh, is uh, looking to get a, a simple model of encouraging non-voters to vote uh, by each person giving and encouraging uh, three others to vote. It's really simple. Um, can you each comment in your final sort of um, uh, closing comments on that and um, that uh, inspirational quote from uh, Anne Frank, no one has ever become poor from giving. What, how would you like to, to close this session off in terms of, you know, a, a political landscape, a, a movement of youth um, uh, trying to tackle that, and uh, a great uh, young woman from years ago talking about uh, generosity? Okay, I know that's crazy, but we have uh, one minute. <laughs> and uh, Lani, you go first. Uh, <laughs> thank you um look uh I think what we can do or what that makes me think about is that that we should be funding and supporting more advocacy advocacy shifts systems and um and it's a really important part of the political landscape it's an important part of the social justice landscape and it's an important part of the funding landscape and it doesn't get enough attention so that's one thing fund advocacy advocacy and the second thing is we need rangatahi we need young people at the front of everything so that's me. Kia ora. Alana? Uh, as a, an immigrant Kiwi, I'm here because I believe we have one of the best chances in the world to build a truly post-colonial 
sustainable, different kind of society than some of the other examples we're seeing or where things are going in other places in the world. We have a lot of problems here, but I think my idealistic self says, I think we could have a chance. So vote, think about how you vote, think about how you encourage other people to vote, think about the future that you wanna see and who do we need to support the most to, to build that future for generations that we're not even gonna see. Kia ora, thanks for having me today. Beautiful, Tish. In the last 10 seconds, <laughs> I would just say that um, I love Anne Frank and I played Anne Frank in a theatre production when I was 13 and that experience has really stuck with me. Um, and so if anyone hasn't read Anne Frank's diary, you should read it. It is actually beautiful and it is still so relevant today. Um, and I read it multiple times sort of preparing for the role. So she's right. <laughs> you cannot get poorer from giving. <laughs> Fantastic way to end. I acknowledge all of the panelists. I acknowledge all of the participants on this call. Um, I acknowledge EHF, um, uh, Erica and the core team in setting this up and enabling this quarter row to happen. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Matewa. Kia To honour everyone's time, we'll wrap up here. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and yeah, you can find the video um, uh, of the recordings on our website to share with your peers. Um, we've got next month's live session on October 25th at the same time with fellows uh, Kirsty Reynolds and Sean McGrail on bridging the gender gap, empowering women founders in New Zealand. So let's close with a karakia. Uh, tuia i runga, tuia i raro, tuia i roto, tuia i waho, tuia i te rang, here tangata, ka rongo te po, ka rongo te ao, te hei mauri e ora, ka kite anō.